to Nerd Talk. I'm Pixie. I'm Sun. And I'm Parasim. And we are good to go to record another episode of Nerd Talk. We are recording this on Tuesday, January 8th of 2013, our new first podcast of the new year. We Which, lived! How was your holiday? Survival-tastic. I suppose that's the best anyone can ask for, really. I died. I don't know, I was kind of looking forward to meteors, tidal waves, random explosions, and oh yeah, zombies. Filling the earth. Brains. Yeah, we weren't that lucky. Well, Brains. Oh yeah, that's right, we did lose Pyrosim. And now the undead Pyrosim. <laughs> he still shows up for podcasts. I want to eat your brains. Brian. <laughs> 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 I want to watch that uh, episode of... Anyhow. So yes, uh, over the break we played lots of things, did lots of stuff. And I saw a whole bunch of movies! And would like to talk about some of them with you over the next hour or so. So hey, welcome back listeners. We've missed you. Hopefully you missed us, or can at least tolerate us for the next hour. Yeah, some of you drop us comments. We like to hear from you. Again, at one point we will actually review Barkley, Shut Up, and Jam Gaiden. Someday. Probably by the time the sequel is out. You are the worst at that. I'm going to have to break down and play it. To to be fair, so far we have fulfilled one fan's request to play a game, and we still regret it. Yeah, about that. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, I'm sorry, Sparkly Kiss, I don't think we're ever going to forgive you for that. Anyhow. Anyhow. So, I'd like to start by discussing a game I've been playing lately with much enthusiasm. And I believe I showed you this uh, pixie during your last visit down here. FTL, Faster Than Light, is an independent game that can be found on Steam. I think the way I described it when I was watching you play was, oh look, it's Oregon Trail in space. I do believe that is the exact uh, description that you gave it. So let's get a bit of vital information going. Uh, FTL is a computer-based space combat simulator. Um, the idea of the game is to accurately simulate what it is like to manage a starship under hostile situations. Uh, the game has you delegating power resources, crew positions, uh, weapon attack, uh, weapon focus, all kinds of things. I'm gonna, I'm gonna pause to interject that you said accurately simulate, like, we don't have these things, if I'm not mistaken, so... And even... Even if it were an attempt to simulate what we assume it would be like, it is. It has a lot of details that would be accurate, but also a lot of details that would be less accurate. For example, there's basically no sublight movement. You are either in a sector or in a different sector, and you only do jumps between them. Yeah, when you jump, you get a brief little flash on your screen, and then you move to the next uh, waypoint, or you jump out of light speed. This was one of the very first Kickstarter games. It was, and I can honestly say it is a great success. Indicates that the service is actually useful for something, and not just a bunch of promises that will turn out to be empty. FTL is quite good. Yeah, um, that said, it is incredibly hard. It is often described as a roguelike, and roguelikes, the term is a bit butchered at this point, but it means games... With permadeath, that you are probably going to play a hundred times and beat once. Yes. Um, So far, according to my Steam, I have played the game for... I'm going to get the exact time here. I have played FTL for 19 hours currently. I did not beat the game until hour 16. Did you beat that on easy or normal? I have only played the game on easy so far. Um, but, easy is a bit of a misnomer there, because that's what it says on the button, but easy is not easy. Don't be fooled. Yeah, uh, all the easy button that was easy. actually does is make it so that enemies do slightly less damage, and you acquire more scrap when you uh, defeat enemies and complete objectives. When you said that phrase, I had to blink several times. That Staples-related phrase. The button. It is not the easy button. Um, so in game, you use your scrap to do uh, various things: upgrade your ship, uh, bribe neutrals and enemies, uh, purchase things from the various shops, and repair your ship from time to time. 
All of this is stretched out in a setting where you are going from one end of the map uh, to the other end to jump to the next uh, sector. And when you get to the final sector, it's called The Last Stand. Your task is to destroy the enemy boss, which is this giant ship that you fight in three phases. Uh, the first phase being a uh, cloaking device and lots of missiles. The second phase being lots of energy weapons and drones. And the third phase being they invade your ship. The narrative of FTL is kind of inverted from the sort of standard narrative of things, in that you are the Federation and the bad guys are the rebels. Usually the good guys are always the rebels in Western culture for some reason. This is backwards. I found that thought hitting me too. I was like, wait a minute, I'm fighting against the rebels? I am the establishment? <laughs> am I a bad guy here? And, and the answer is no, you, you are not. You are not the bad guy here. I uh, think more like Federation from Star Trek kind of thing. You, in fact, encounter a number of NPCs throughout the game, or who will say, I would have liked it better with the Federation, but, you know, money is money, or they have my family, or I'm being forced to work for the Rebels for some other nefarious reason. Yep. So yeah, uh, overall, FTL is super cool. I, I like that every time I unlock a new ship, it really feels like the game has completely changed. Because the, the first ship you have is the uh, the basic Kessel ship, which is a neutral ship, and it starts the game with a missile system and a burst laser system. And that's what you play with. You get, I think, three normal human crew members. But then the first ship I unlocked was the, uh, I think it's pronounced Engi Race's uh, ship, which comes standard with an ion beam to just disable things, and a, uh, and a single drone, which will fly around the enemy ship and shoot it. And the two play completely differently. Uh, for beating the game for the first time, you unlock the Federation ship, which actually has a sub-weapon system called the Artillery Beam that automatically cuts through all enemy lasers and through the majority of the enemy ship after it charges for 50 seconds. And does that cost any consumables? No, it, it's not consumable. It's just the, the recharge time that is what prohibits it from overpowering the game. And even when right. you fully upgrade that weapon, it still has a 20-second cooldown time between shots. The missile launcher that comes with the Kessel consumes missiles and the NG ship. I, I assume it's pronounced NG myself because they get a bonus to operating their stations, and it's said in the lore that they're kind of cybernetic. So yep. I figure their name is just Engineer, cut short. Fair enough. But their ship is has drones as their primary weapon. Is mm -hmm. that correct? That is correct. And those consume a different type of consumable called drone parts. Yep. Those are actually what I finished the game using the first time. Uh, had three of the little attack drones and two ion weapons. So basically I just disabled their shields constantly with the ion weapons and the drones just went to work. Ion weapons are nasty because you can upgrade your shields such that you have multiple bars, but then ion weapons, one hit on your shields will disable your entire shield system for a timer, even if you had four bars of shields. I'm yeah. Like, oh no. And, and they can do that to disable any system, which is the awesome part about them. Yep. So if they have two shots of the ion weapon, they can get through your shields and then hit your weapons, and then you are sitting there floating helpless, waiting to die. Yep. Uh, the other really sadistic thing you can do with ion weapons is if you can break through their shields, just target their oxygen supply indefinitely. <laughs> Enemy ships can jump away in the middle of combat if they find the situation unfavorable. Can you do that? Yes, you can. Uh, oh. Anytime your jump drive is charged, you can jump away. I so, see, I've never tried that. Th this can be improved by improving your ship's engines, which will improve the speed of that of your jump charging, as well as your ability to evade enemy shots. One of the things you have to micromanage in battles is that if you're hit with a laser weapon or some kind of conventional weapon, you will catch fire in certain parts of your ship. And there's a couple possible. ways you can deal with that. There's a, another species of crew member you can get called the Rock. Is that even their name? Yep, that is their name. Okay, and they're just rock golem type people. You have people, Dwayne Johnson on your fire. ship. 
Yes, Dwayne Johnson, the wrestler, will come in with a 4x4 four four in his hand <laughs> and beat the fire with this giant stick until it goes out. Because he's so hardcore and muscly, he's immune to fire. Uh, you can also do this with crew types who are not immune to fire, but they will burn up in the process, so that's bad. You'll tend to run one crew member in and have them try and put out part of the fire, and then run them to the medical bay so they can heal up and send the next one in to finish the job. Yep, although there are other ways to deal with fire. For instance, if a room is on fire that happens to be near the uh, the exit doors to your ship, why not just vent the fire out into space? That is, in fact, the most effective way to deal with it, although that carries the consequence of your oxygen subsystem has to replenish that, which means it will be slower at repairing damage to other parts of your ship if the... If you have oxygen depleted in some other way, which can happen with enemy teleporters or people who beam on board can... Oh, that's another thing you can do with the airlocks, is if enemies beam on board with the teleporters, you can vent those into space too. Well, it's a bit of a slower process than you'd expect in real life. Yeah, that only really works if uh, you have the improved blast doors so that they can't get out of that room. Otherwise, really? if you only have level 1 doors, they can just walk through them freely. I believe Pixie was rather impressed with the whole subsystem dealing with oxygen and venting things into space and how relatively realistic that is. Mm -hmm. That mechanism is probably why they call it a simulation. It's like, yeah, we have oxygen, and you can vent things to space, and then the oxygen replenishes with the this synthesis system. Well, I also learned the hard way that if you have the crew transporter upgrade available... um. Teleporting into an unmanned spaceship, they don't have an oxygen system. Yep. Therefore, there is no oxygen there. And Therefore, crew my crew like, that teleported oh, dropped God. dead. <laughs> Why would you do idea. this, Captain? No! I, I'm impressed none of them questioned your orders. No, they, they just went along with it. Stupidly. Foolishly. If you have level 2 sensors, then you can see that the enemy ship doesn't have any oxygen in it. But if you only have level that... 1 sensors, which you start with, you would just kind of assume that there is oxygen in the enemy ship. And then teleport over there and be like, oh, I see now, in retrospect, that I have made a mistake. Yeah, that unfortunately is one of the absolute last upgrades I usually take. Like, only if my ship is doing phenomenally well will I take an upgrade to my sensor systems. Sensor upgrades cost a lot of scrap, and never, ever do you get enough scrap to upgrade everything in a playthrough. No. Which, you know, I kind of wanted to see what would happen if, like, there was, say, a cheat engine for the game, so that I could just, like, yep, start with four million scrap. Here you go, have everything. And, of course, there is, and I have done that. How'd that go for you? Uh, you are super overpowered, and you just kind of blow through everything. Like, yeah, I have a hundred missile parts, so I'll just turn my missile launcher on auto-fire, and that blows everything up. Also, I have four bars of shields, and I have, like, six NG crew members, so all of my stations are manned with bonuses. And then I have some rocks who don't have any stations to man, because all of them are manned by NGs. But the rocks can punch any any intruders who teleport on board. Yeah, I particularly enjoy having Mantis crew members for that. Oh, yes, Mantis are cool. They move super fast and they do extra combat damage, which makes them the ideal crew for invading an enemy ship. Unfortunately, invasions never go well for me. Like, I, I've pretty much written it off as do not do. So, FTL is super cheap, so there's not much barrier for entry if you sound if you think you're interested in it. Yeah, it's like five ninety nine on Steam. Yeah. In fact, it's, this advice is not quite timely because it was like $3 on Steam at one point during their Christmas sale, but... Steam sales always come back around. Just wait three months and there will be another one. Yep. So, Pixie, I hear you saw the Steven Spielberg slash Daniel Day-Lewis movie about Abraham Lincoln titled Lincoln. I did. So wait, um, the one without vampires? Yes. It is a bit confusing to talk about those because, yes, uh, there have been multiple conversations I've had where I'm like, I'm going to go see Lincoln. And people are like, you mean Abraham Lincoln Vampire Hunter? And I'm like, no. Just Lincoln. Just Lincoln. That is the entirety of the title. Lincoln without the cool bits. <laughs> hey, there are some cool bits. All uh, right, nothing... proceed with your criticism. 
They they are d- not quite the same kind of cool as wrapping, you know, the chain of a pocket watch around your hand as impromptu knucks and punching a vampire in the face, but... Chest. What is? Punch through his chest. That's right. <laughs> it's been a while since I've seen it. That's about as cool as it can be. This is a different kind of cool. Uh, this, this movie was all about the actors. Like, the, the set pieces are kind of nice, but that's not really the focus of everything. It, it's a lot of very tight shots on faces and stuff. And a lot of the focus is on the performances. And the performances are really good. So, it's a good thing that was the point of focus there. They also like uh, exaggerating with via camera angles and depth of field just how tall he is compared to everybody else. But... Uh, Daniel D. Lewis, freaking great as Abraham Lincoln. Uh, did you see this movie? I don't know how much. I have not seen Lincoln, but I have seen shots. Okay, so I don't want to spoil the specifics then. Are you going to spoil the ending on me? <laughs> Surprise! Abraham Lincoln is not immortal, and if you paid attention in history, he gets shot at the theater. But, okay, you know, just but... checking. Spoilers! Uh, let's see. Tommy Lee Jones was born to insult people. That is his calling in life. And he gets to do it a lot in this movie, so it's perfect. But he also gets to, you also get the, like, vindication of him being on the correct side of things, too. Is the people he's insulting are the ones who don't want the amendment abolishing slavery to pass. So it's like, yeah, you tell him! Uh, slave, like, slavers are just as good as Nazis for people who are absolute villains. I, 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 I would love slavers with Nazis yeah. with zombies for bad guys that you feel no sympathy for. Yeah, it's like, you can totally just do whatever to them, and it doesn't matter. Like, you don't need to bother setting up why we are supposed to hate this person. It's, oh, right? this person yeah. owns people. It's we hate Nazis, them. Russians, and the no, uh, or no, a, not, Russians, not the Russians, Soviets. Like, yeah. in movies, it's the Soviets, it's the, uh, no, the Nazis. No, because you've got, you've got plenty of times where people have, um, are you still, are you talking, like, historically, like, it used to be that way, or, because, like, I would say... I'm talking, you look at the new, the newest Indiana Jones movie, and it's just like, why are they evil? Because they're Soviets. The newest Indiana Jones movie isn't very good, though. No, I'm not saying that terrible. it's right to do that. I would argue that if you take, like, an honest historical perspective, and just put, like, Gorbachev next to, oh, I don't know, Nixon, I think... Nixon turns out to be the evil one in that comparison. Yeah, I yeah, I'm I'm not. I can't willing argue to look with that. I've seen The Watchmen. That's that breaks my head hurt for other reasons, but I'm I'm just not going to touch that because we're never going to get through the show if I have to dismantle everything you say. Back to Nixon. Nixon had slaves, and therefore he was the worst person. Wait, no. <laughs> Tommy Lee Jones insults. So I don't know how much I can say without ruining this, because I really feel like you ought to see it. Like, it was one of the great films of 2012. Like, that was a thing that I think it would be remembered for. Uh, I would say a lot of it revolves around Lincoln relates to relates certain situations to people by telling them stories that seem totally unrelated, and then it's like, there's a clincher, and then you're like, oh, this totally makes sense. He's like that kindly old like, dad figure, and it's totally adorable. Except I usually scream at people like that to get to the point. It's very well done. The stories don't meander all that much. Okay. I I can't really give you, like, the good example that I'm thinking in my head, but Pyro, you probably know exactly the one I'm talking about. The story about the portrait of George Washington? Yes, I know the one. People I saw that with were quoting that bit for days. And you, listener, if you know the story we're talking about, you will also recognize it. It's pretty good. If I don't, you go see I don't the movie say after hearing this review, then you'll recognize it in retrospect. Yeah, I, I, I don't want to say anything with sense still being in the dark, so I suppose we should just move on. Lincoln was awesome and really kind of makes you appreciate um, all of the work that goes into... Uh, the political process, I think, and gives you, like, an appreciation for that moment in history. 
I think. More politically accurate than the Schoolhouse Rock I Am a Bill song. <laughs> Guaranteed. Yeah, I, I, okay, I will get behind that. <laughs> At least there weren't vampires. All right. I also hear you saw Django Unchained. And As we've all I. seen that. Um, I also saw Looper, but I think I'm the only one here who's seen that, so. So far, yes. We'll shelve that for a bit. But yes, all three of us have seen I've our seen Django Unchained twice! Django. So, spoiler alert, it's good? Yep, spoiler tag this, we're good to go. Hey guys, we are about to spoil Django Unchained. If you have not yet seen it by the time you are watching this podcast, you should go do so and come back later. Alright, there's your warning. Django Unchained was awesome! Okay, welcome back. Django Unchained was awesome. <laughs> I go into this, and you know it's a Tarantino movie, like, right from the opening credits. Just the title sequence is, like, uh, the use of this particular font just says Tarantino. It's Also the background music. That, too. The Django song. Yeah. Uh... One of, one of the really cool things that I noticed, and I've been told that I kind of flail my arms a bit and you know, enthusiastically point out every time he uses rack focus, but lots of really good use of rack focus. Anyhow, I'm going to set that film nerdi- nerding aside here and talk about the actual movie and not just the mechanics of it. This movie was really uncomfortable to sit through for like the first, I don't know, most of it, first half. You feeling some guilt there, Pix? It's it's not even just the, it's not even just the cultural guilt. It's not like we personally did anything to perpetuate this reality. It's just a part of American history that you just kind of have to look at and go, "That's really screwed up." Yeah, we did that Ugh. as a country. Yeah, and you can't even hide behind like the one good white character because even he's going, he's German. "What the heck, America?" Because he's German. <laughs> And everyone else is terrible. And you see a lot of, like, really awful, those stereotype icons of the South. Lots of caricatures in yes, this movie. Yes, that's, that's the word I'm looking for. So the story follows Django, who is a slave uh, who is sold off from his wife and then eventually freed by a bounty hunter who needs information that he has. Uh, the bounty hunter takes pity on him and ends up training him to be a fellow bounty hunter before they go off to Missouri. Or Mississippi. no, Mississippi. Worse than Missouri. Yeah, Just also, longest title to see run across a screen ever. <laughs> Which is why I have a feeling he picked Mississippi as the state. I'm sitting here going, M I S S I S S. Right. Um, so he ends up going to Mississippi to free his wife from the arch slaver. Uh, what was the character's name? Candy. Calvin Candy. Yeah. Um, Calvin. Calvin Candy, Candy who was played by Leonardo DiCaprio. Who is so slimy. It yeah, the he's, worst. he's a complete sleaze bag in the movie, and it's great. It's the worst because he's a sleaze bag, and he thinks he's that polished like proper southern gentleman. Well, he thinks he's charismatic. That's yeah. the thing. Like, he thinks he has the the appeal of, say, like, a, a really great charismatic villain. Um, the example that I heard used by uh, Movie Bob was, like, the Joker, or Bane from the Batman movies, where this guy is oddly charismatic, terrible, but there's some appeal there. Candy has none of that. He just thinks he does. Yeah, Candy is terrible on Every level. But that even that alone has appeal as a character. Um, arguably, the larger villain in the movie is Samuel L. Jackson. Yeah. Which, who when is you saw awesome. him, I don't know. I didn't know he was in this going into it, and then I was surprised. It was and a I Tarantino was like, movie. I had a feeling he'd be here. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I didn't. I, I was like, oh. Well, all right. The, and by the way, the scene where they introduce him was just brilliantly shot, where, like, they slowly bring the riders into focus. Oh my gosh, that was amazing. Like, you just see him squinting, and then you see, Fixies like, they're fuzzy and out of focus, and then they gradually bring them into focus. Oh, it's great. That's amazing. There's a lot of really amazing just cinematography really in this. Really great the, camera work. The there. iconic blood spray over the white flowers is going to be seen over and over again. That's cotton, dude. 
Oh. My bad. It's all symbolic and stuff. <laughs> yeah, everyone in this movie has ridiculously high blood pressure and a yep, surprising the, the, amount. Um, the, the thing with Tarantino movies, and he does it in all of his movies, is when somebody gets hurt, they oh, it the blood spatter always looks like Kool-Aid being pumped through a high-pressure hose that someone sat on and then cut. <laughs> yeah, it... Like, this movie holds no bars about how violent it is. Like, there, there's and a scene towards the end of the movie where Django's like just, like, worst. going nuts in the house, and bodies everywhere. Like, people who've already been shot are being reshot by their friends multiple times. That's See, that's one kind of funny, in a way, and two... That, at that point, it's horrific. a victory. No, at that point, you're like, yeah, get him! Um, whereas, like, the other... There are other scenes that are not as... They don't lay on with the blood spray. Brutal, but they're, I think, is the word you're looking for. But they're really intense and really uncomfortable to watch and really nauseating. And right. The, well, the first person that Django shoots is the father of this trio gang that he's after. They're three brothers. Yeah, and all he takes is just, like, a little pinpoint of red in his chest, and then he falls over. Hmm. That's it. Everyone else in the movie is like, yep, got shot, giant spray. Django's first bounty is not very visibly violent, because it is shot from very far away, but he kills a father in front of the father's son, and the camera sort of lingers from a distance on the son freaking out over the fact that his sh father just got shot while just plowing this over. field. Yep. Mm -hmm. And so... Uh, the kid doesn't even know that, presumably, that the father was a stagecoach robber back in the day. The kid is just like, oh god, dad, what the heck? Yep. I think you're paraphrasing no. there, but yes. I, I think a lot of this movie comes down to the characters being so well played. Jamie Foxx is awesome as Django, who, throughout the entire movie, does this very quiet, restrained thing, except for when he's playing his part. And towards the end of the movie, when you finally get to see Django being Django, when there's nothing holding him back anymore, it is amazing to watch. Um, uh, Dr. Schultz in the movie, the, the bounty hunter character, is fantastic in every single scene he's in. He's hilariously funny when he needs to be. All of his plans are just great to watch. Uh, his bow he's a smooth he, he's operator. He's full dude. of charisma. His bowing horse, Fritz, is just... It's adorable. Uh, great to see. Like there, there was no part of this movie where I was like, "Huh, it's still yeah, going." Christopher Waltz was scene after scene. I was just like, what "I want more of this." Yep. Okay. Well, what about the part? Okay, the thing with the bags and the KKK was pretty funny. I feel like that went on for a little while, and I was enjoying it's every second of it because it's Jonah Hill being stupid in a scene where people are arguing about the KKK hoods. And the reason that I'll say that I liked the fact that the scene with the hoods went on for so long is because it's immediately preceded by a scene where Dr. King Schultz's hand takes a pile of money out of the tooth on the top of his wagon and places, like, this unrecognizable black brick inside of it, and it's like, no, it was actually soap rags. No, No. They, they were kerosene soap rags. Right. I just saw this dynamite. last night, so... <laughs> The scene is pretty quick, and it's, like, at night, so it's dark. Right. So you so might it's think, a, what did what, he just what, do what was that that he just put in there? And then it gives you just long enough to forget about it, and then it pays it off right after you've forgotten about it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd, I'd say a lot of the editing work is really good. That scene probably went on that long for a specific reason. The... Shoot, where was I going with this? You two stall for me, I have to get that memory back. <laughs> Another scene, like the one of the blood right, spattering across the... Sorry. See, this is why I didn't start talking. <laughs> no, 
No, but you do keep chewing on your hand or like I keep I, having to get you to stop freaking thumb sucking while you're talking. It's the it's worst. You guys on. don't hear me talk on this show very often, but you don't know how much work I do in the micromanaging these guys. From now on, do I just like need a straitjacket when we record? Yeah, the like, show? do I have to like hold your hand the entire podcast? No. <laughs> <laughs> Again, this is what I do when I think. Right. It's it's and the the thing about editing kind of jogged it back in my memory here was Tarantino movies tend to jump around a lot, and this does that a little bit before Tarantino movie. This was pretty straightforward. Yeah. It's a Western revenge movie, and there, that's there it. There were a couple scenes that were out of place. They were out of place on the time. timeline, but they're also directly related to what's going on. Like, everything right. is very, like, you don't have to follow multiple plot threads. It's just, this is what's happening in a very linear fashion. Mm-hmm. Like, you, for the scene and with the, uh, the KKK and the tooth, you saw the tooth get loaded with the rags. Then you saw the riders run in, and then suddenly we're, we cut back to the riders before they started their charge, and then we go back to the riders running in. Mm-hmm. So that that was a little jarring. Took me a second to figure out what had just happened. Where where did that come from? Yeah. But the payoff was totally worth it in every. I way. would say that that's basically how you could sum up this whole movie. Was it was really yeah. uncomfortable, long for parts, and then like the payoff, and it's a. Big payoff. Totally worth it. Oh, I loved watching the manor house blow up at the end because yeah. I'm like, that and was then, a big I was, explosion. I was like, oh great, we're, I, I've got my you know fist under my chin, going, oh great, we're gonna get another cool guys. Don't look at explosions. And then he puts on sunglasses and deliberately stands there and watches the explosion. And I'm like, yes, just no, deliberately cool defying the trope. Looks at the explosion. Like Django totally wants to watch that explosion. I think he earned it. But yeah, so far, really great movie. I'm trying to think who is the worst character in that movie. Like, Like behavior-wise or acting-wise? Oh, morally? Candy. Without a doubt. I mean, because you've got Candy, but you've also got Steven. No, Candy's worse. Yeah. Steven's just, like, allowing these things to happen. Steven's just like, yeah, I'll run with it. Candy's the one who's coming up with all the ideas. I would say Steven is kind of morally culpable here, though, because he's he's not just... He's not passive, as you make it sound. And once Steven is sort of off the hook, which is, say, after Calvin Candy is dead, he doesn't really let up with being evil, because no, there's the scene going. where Jamie Foxx is upside down, and Steven is talking about the LaQuint Dickey Mining Company, which is an amazing bit of monologue, by the way. Like, let's do this horrible thing to him. Why, the people we send to the LaQuint Dickey Mining Company get worse than that. How about this other thing? Well, the people we send to the LaQuint Dickey Mining Company get worse than that. And so um, finally, but... Miss Candy came up with the idea... Out of nowhere! What about we sell Django to the LaQuint Dickey Mining Company? And I said, well, that's a great idea. Yeah. Yeah, Steven might actually be more evil than Candy was. Yeah, like, he sits there and, like, hatches these, like, plans to cause something. Not that Candy does it. Yeah, I think it was just that horrible moment early on, the first time you see Candy, where it's like, those men are going to kill each other in this room for their entertainment. Yep. This no, is awful. they're all freaking awful. I'm just saying, like, and, and of course it's totally subjective, and it was just a thought exercise to, like, sit here and go, man, these are all a bunch of really terrible people. Yeah. So... When the implied incest between uh, Candy and his sister was set up, at first I was thinking this was quite over the top and unnecessary, but I feel like that was paid off by the fact that it was his sister who came up with the idea of selling, well, who <laughs> enacted Air the quotes. idea, because obviously enacted. it was Stevens from yeah, the very Stevens beginning, idea. <laughs> who used her whiteness in order to make this happen of selling Django to the LaQuint Dickey Mining Company. It's like, okay, she wants revenge for her lover slash brother. Uh, this kind of made the very strong incest implication less gratuitous. Mm. Yeah. Overall, I I think Django is... I, I don't think there's a like hard moral lesson in this movie, and I think that's the best part. It's like, a the, revenge the, movie. The moral lesson is, slavery is bad. Okay, we've got... 
I think we've established that one. I think we're good with that one. I, I think a lot of people, though, don't, like, we kind of get that on a surface level. But, like, that kind of really internalizes it a bit, like, oh, dang, this is what that involved. Yeah, we really like, the did actual... the fight to the death thing. We really did the fight to the death thing. We really did the tearing people apart by dogs thing. Like, all of that, I think what's par- partly of what's so horrible about this is it isn't really an exaggeration. That happened. Yeah, the... That's part of American Candy's history. Candy's lecture at the table about the differences between the brains... Mm-hmm. Of the, the slave and non-slave, yeah. Crap. No, Someone that, actually believed that. At that some that point. was actually science that people believed at the time. That's well, science in scare quotes because it's yeah. utter crap. <laughs> no, overall, it it's a really good movie. I would argue it's it like, might be Tarantino's I, 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 there's, best. There's there's a lot of like it's just it, this is gonna we're not gonna like cut away from this. You have to see it. You're yeah. gonna you are gonna sit through this. Oh. Frankly, I found. I found Django to be a more satisfying revenge film than, say, Kill Bill, yeah. which was a pure revenge film. Two of them, in fact. Well, what was Kill Bill even a revenge film for? I mean, Inglorious Bastards is obviously very similar insofar as it is revenge on the Nazis for the Holocaust. But Kill Bill... Kill Bill is a very specific... It's a micro-vengeance. It's, it's revenge for one, for one uh, woman against the people who messed up her life. But right, it's but it's also revenge against the several hundred people who follow those people. Mm-hmm. But like, I guess it's my not like a is demographic that... thing is what Pyro's getting at, I think. Right. It is possible that an audience member can watch Inglorious Bastards, and they feel the catharsis of getting revenge on the Nazis because an audience member can personally have been harmed by the Holocaust. Right. And, I mean... While slavery was a bit further back, racism still exists, and somebody could take a personal catharsis in the racism revenge of Django. As Kill Bill is is a revenge film like you'd call it a heist film, but it doesn't have that reality to it. Yeah, I see Kill Bill almost as more of just a straight-up action movie, I guess, partly because it's just, this is a personal journey of one person. Kill Bill's practically action satire at this point, though. Oh, yeah. Because it's so over-the-top and ridiculous. Well, that too, but... You know, Uma Thurman does charge a room with only a sword and slaughter 89 people. Mm Mm-hmm. Which was awesome, but... (laughs) A weirdly personal note about Django is that Pixie and I had just recently been shooting for probably, was it your first time shooting, Pixie? Oh, God, no. Okay. Well, it <laughs> wasn't mine either. I, I have I have done a little bit of shooting earlier a long time ago, but it's not something that I had done regularly. And so we had been out doing it, and there is a scene, a training montage, where Django is learning to shoot by shooting a snowman. And I really wanted to shoot a snowman after watching this movie. That seems like the coolest thing. On to League's stuff, because we have that. We've kind of had a lull since, uh... A lull in lull? Yeah, since, uh, Riot's kind of been on vacation for the holidays. They're now Although the gifting thing, back. did we talk about the gifting thing? Because the I, gifting thing was awesome. No, we did not talk about the gifting thing. So a big part of the snowdown holiday that they did was... You could finally gift champions and skins and RP to people. Which was awesome! As and a, it's still doing it, right? As a wonderful little test. No, it actually ended two days ago. Oh, well, I haven't logged in in precisely that long, so... So, yeah. Um, that was a part of the Snowdown holiday. It was basically a test run to see, you know, can we do this without getting tons of reports of problems and fraud, people stealing each other's accounts. Mm-hmm. And it seems to have been successful. Like, it went really well. I gifted RP a skin and a champion to different people and got my little prizes for doing it and felt really good for doing it because every time I get on now, I get to see my uh, my friend throws down with his uh, Mistletoe LeBlanc skin that I got him. And you've been playing Vi, who we'll talk about in a few minutes. Oh, man, I'm so and excited I've about that. I have no idea what Alvarian bought with his RP, but I know he liked it. I actually gifted Wukong to um, to Daniel, who uh, just started playing. Yep, <laughs> because he was like, I need a new top lane champ. What do you think of this one? Oh, no, 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 no. You're going to play this one. 
Let's pick someone good and go from there. <laughs> like he was playing Garen. And then and he was Garen's like, "It's a bit boring." And well, yeah, Garen's a bit boring, but you know, it's good to learn and to start with. And uh, and then he's all like, "I'm thinking about Trindamir," and I'm like, "Nope, nope." Here, have a woo call. <laughs> Let's stop that right now. <laughs> <laughs> Let's just nip that in the bud there. So yes, it it was a very cool experiment, and I distinctly enjoyed it. Pyro, I believe you got a gift as well. From Pixie, in fact, it was the Alien Invader Heimerdinger skin, which is actually quite nice. Yep. Uh, as part of the holiday sale, they brought back a lot of skins that had been retired, uh, including that one, for a limited time. I believe they have just all been returned to the vault. Mm -hmm. So, I now can play jacks with a fishing pole to beat people with. You know, I thought about giving you that. I got that from another person on my friends list. Uh, thank you, Jace, for that wonderful gift. If any if, of you actually listen to this. They totally don't. But still not a cardboard tube. Yeah, no, that one's a little harder to get. But yeah, um, also Alvarian gifted me the uh, other Rengar skin, Headhunter Rengar, which I had never acquired because I was waiting to pick that one in in order to celebrate Rengar getting rebuffed, which is supposedly coming in the next few patches. So yeah, um, I guess we can talk about the two champions that have been released since the last time we uh, actually talked League on the podcast. So first up is Nami. The yes. tide caller. The fish. Mermaid. Because, you Yay. know, feet are weird. Yeah, we could, we could do a whole team now of just people who don't have feet. But just champions without feet. There's potential there. That could be a thing. My my primary champ does not have feet. So does mine. So yeah, um, <laughs> this was Riot's promise to unleash a support champion by the end of the year. And in a big way, they've succeeded. Yep, she seems to be pretty good. She does a little bit of everything. She's got a bit of CC, a bit of healing, a bit of damage, a bit of buffing. And a really interesting ult that gives uh, both players of and opponents of a lot of uh, possibilities to how to react to her, which is exactly what they said they wanted to do. You know, her most interesting move is probably her uh, her W, which it throws out a jet of water, which will bounce between ally and enemy champions. It'll bounce up to three times. It can only hit a single target once per casting. So if you cast it on an enemy, it bounces to them, does damage, and then will bounce to a nearby allied champ to heal them before bouncing to another enemy and finishing. If cast on an ally, it will hit the ally, heal them, bounce to the nearest enemy, do damage to them, and then bounce to another nearby ally, healing them. Will this heal minions? No, it will not react to minions in any way. Um, her Q is a bubble that is thrown out, and it's a skill shot, so when the bubble lands, any enemies caught in it will be picked up for a few seconds and then dropped back down, in addition to taking some damage. Uh, and her R, her final piece of CC, is a giant tidal wave that she throws out, has the distance of about a lane, and can go the distance of about two towers. It increases speed as it travels away from her, and enemies hit will take a slight bit of damage and be knocked into the air briefly. Overall, I think she's really cool. I I like her style. I think she's got a cool voice. Her quotes are interesting. The animation is a little bit weird. But... It's a little weird to see a character with no legs who is an aquatic character moving on land. Like... Fizz barely managed to be believable. Like, the thing that really pushed legs. it was his alt. Yeah. Where the shark leaps through the ground. Mm -hmm. Which is just super cool by merit of how stupid and ridiculous it is. I like it a lot. But yeah, Nami still swims mm -hmm. when she's just moving around. In fact, if you uh, increase her speed, she'll go from the little uh, splashing movement that she does when moving to a full-out swim. Mm -hmm. If she's moving at fast enough speeds. That's pretty sophisticated. That's awesome. That's a neat detail. Uh, and then, also, the, the newest champ at the moment, and the last one that we have announced data for, is Vi. 
Tell me, does the Vi stand for viable? <laughs> Indeed it does, sir. Indeed it does. That, that, that's a gem right there. A champion so cool, she got her own theme song. And that's the only champion where, upon release, like, I actually sit at the, I usually turn off the animations and the music at the login screen and just get through it as quickly as possible. I actually sit, I actually b- both leave both of those up and I actually sit through the song on occasion. It, it's a really good song. Like, it was written by a fan who sent it in, and Riot was like, yeah, we're gonna use that. Mm. So now that is the Vi initial screen. Like, upon seeing that, I, I was excited about Vi before I saw any of that, because it's like, I, I looked at her previews and stuff that was on uh, Surrender 20, and I was like, this is a cool champ. I want to play her. She seems like an awesome top lane. Mm. When I jumped on for the first time and saw that load screen, I'm like, oh, this this is the champion. It's gonna be good. This is so awesome. Like, she's got her big steampunk fist. She's bobbing back and forth. She's got her nice... Heck. She's got her punk rock uh, anthem going behind her. Like, she is just cool. <laughs> In-game, she's super fun to play. Uh, this is the first time I have ever played as a melee range champ. Yep. Fun fact. Yeah, you usually play as, uh, as the full range. Usually the longer range champions, too. I go, I'm way over here! <laughs> if you can. Often Vi's lore companion, Caitlin. With Vi, you want people closing in on you, trying to do damage to you, um, because you're just going to turn around and wreck them. Like It is very hard to bring down Vi if you just try to stick to her, because she will eventually out-damage you. Um, Vi's Q is a wonderful uh, engage and escape move where she dashes forward and briefly bounces the opposing champion that she collides with. Uh, her W allows her to, uh, after attacking a target for the third time, increases her attack speed and destroys that target's armor. Mm. Like, completely wrecks it. 20% increase on both. It is brutal when that connects. And is why Vi oh, so wins. she gets armor. Um, when they lose energy. armor and she no, increases her attack speed. Yeah, her passive ability is called Blast Shield. She gets 10% of her health as a free shield every few seconds while she's using her moves. Phenomenal at keeping her alive. Means that effectively in a prolonged fight, she's actually got like 130% health. Uh, her E is how she actually deals with ranged harass characters. She creates a blast wave behind the initial target that she punches. Also really good at getting through waves of minions. Yeah. Um, in house. Actually, the first time that the champion spotlight has taught me anything about how to use a champion properly, uh, you use her Q to dash through a wave of minions, immediately turn around and punch the last one using excessive force. It should clear most of the minion wave. And her ultimate assault and battery charges at the target that she selects, ignoring any CC that she collides with in the meantime. And once she collides with that target, she knocks them into the air and puts them into the ground, suppressing them for a few seconds. The ultimate in dealing with enemy AD carries. Because that is a good three seconds that they are out of the fight and you are locked onto them. She's just awesome. Yeah. The only problem is she can't chase for a damn. No, she has no sticking ability whatsoever. The enemy can pretty much always just walk away from you pre-level 6. After level 6, you have at least an option to keep them there. And once you build a frozen mallet, it's game on. Vi will just wreck people. So yeah, overall, she's a great add to the game. Has me super excited about what Riot's going to be doing in 2013. But, yeah. so, yeah, this is the first time I've played a Melee champ, and I like her a whole lot, and so I've been working on building my room page for her, and... Champ 107, huge win. It's pretty great. Here's hoping for 108. Supposedly we're getting another AD carry soon. We kind of took a break from those after Draven. Let's go Draven. Always Draven. I kind of don't like Draven. It's the League of Draven. I'm not even going to acknowledge that. So yeah, League We're, of Legends this continues also, to be awesome. Should we mention the thing in the works or wait until that's... Go ahead. Um, so, Sen, you mentioned the idea of, man, those uh, Hextech lo- gauntlets look like they would be super fun to build. 
Yeah, I'm, I'm definitely thinking we're going to be doing a Nerd Talk cosplay of Vi. Yay! I would be wearing the costume, not him, relax. Yeah, it would be really <laughs> awkward if I were in that costume. <laughs> so, so, yeah. I'm already on wig acquisition and stuff. I, I'm this currently in the cool. planning phase for how to build Vi's Hextech gauntlets. That's going to be Man, nuts. these are going to be heavy. <laughs> Uh, looks, it looks like I'm going to get my lift on. Yeah. <laughs> but if they work right, they'll be uh, functional, so we will actually have moving parts on them. Well, they'll be functional in that they will light up and have moving bits. They will not allow me to punch through mountains. I don't know. I'm, I'm kind of working on that, too. Th that would be cool. <laughs> I would like to punch through buildings and stuff. Not that I would do that. <laughs> Any fans who happen to be engineers, get in contact with me. We'll, uh, we'll compare notes on how to not have these break Pixie's shoulder. <laughs> so yeah, that's, that's going to be fun. And apparently on the uh, release today notes, we needed another Shaco skin? Admit it, it's distinctly non-Shaco-ish. I thought that Shaco was a lady for the longest time. I was surprised when I found out Shaco was a dude. You've never played I don't a even know how you would see that, but okay. I, I have never played a Shaco. Uh, it's just, just assumed, I guess. So what, you thought Shaco was just like an old woman or something? Yep. Okay. Because you always get the Shaco noise when uh, Shaco dies. It's like the very satisfying <laughs> as it falls over. Does the clone do that? Yes, the clone actually stabs itself when it dies. Fancy. Yes, the new skin is an Asian-themed skin called Mask Shaco, which is wearing a kabuki mask. Woo! Yep. So I Other guess things that have that. come out. XCOM got a new free DLC slash patch called Second Wave, which fixed a number of bugs and also added a bunch of checkboxes allowing you to make the campaign either longer or more difficult if you want, or potentially easier, but probably not. Um, there's a couple that make uh, stat bonuses for new soldiers when they level up be random. There's one that makes the campaign take much, much longer. There's one that makes psionics very rare, which I've got to imagine would make the game tremendously difficult, because psionics in XCOM? Totally OP. Use psionics all the time if you can. And accompanying that patch has been the announcement of many, many planned new DLCs. Not with specifics, but with the intention that Firaxis intends to support this as, quote, a platform for future projects. Sweet. Oh, I think that Sen and I can agree that that is desirable, because XCOM is a super fun game. Yes, absolutely love this game. I've played through it three times now, and loved every time. Like, I liked it so much, I bought the DLC when it came out, and also picked up the unlockables for the Game of the Year edition. Or not Slingshot, Year, the, that uh... new DLC was called? Yes. And it was very enjoyable. It It adds three missions to the game that have you first picking up a key witness of the alien invasion who then joins your team, so you can keep him as long as you can keep him alive. A very cool mission where you have to plant uh, homing beacons on a train in a limited number of turns. You have to fight your way to the front of the train. And then a the first mission where you take on a, an alien battleship while it is in the air above uh, a city. Oh, that's intense. Yeah, it, it was very enjoyable, and... Uh, Fast forward some of the unlockables in the game, like you can start researching Plasma Tech immediately after finishing the third mission. Oh wow, that seems like that'd be pretty powerful. Admitted, you still don't have a, a lot of resources to do this. No, you need money and also weapon fragments and such. Right, which is the limiting factor of why this isn't just OP fast forward you through the game. Other announcements that are super exciting but also kind of vague... Pokemon X and Y have been announced for the 3DS. Finally, a frickin' 3DS exclusive. Some software that makes owning a 3DS worthwhile. Uh, this is going to be three-dimensional. It's going to have a three-dimensional battle system with 
cool new animations that look totally different than any previous Pokemon battle system. Other than maybe Pokemon Stadium for the Nintendo 64. That is actually kind of what the battle looks like. But in 3D, as well as in 3D, it is polygonal instead of sprite-based, and also it has a lenticular screen. Yeah, to be also, honest, I'm kind of excited about this. Like, if this comes out and gets decent reviews, I may be buying myself a 3DS. I own one, purchased exclusively for the purpose of playing Animal Crossing Wild World for the original DS. I was like, well, I, I only bought this fairly recently, and I was like, okay, surely, surely I am going to want to play some 3DS software at some point in time. And this has justified my decision. Now, I was going to say, I, would, I tried to talk you out of that because I figured it was a bad idea, and I bought the stupid thing at midnight launch day. Pixie is an ambassador. Indeed. And I was hopefully really starting to regret awesome. the stupid purchase, really. And so hopefully this makes me come back round again. The trailer video is nice and pretty. Look it up on YouTube. Also announced is the Sims 3 University expansion. Which excites <gasps> there me is because... a fire type f that is also a fox. I am in. I am so in. Can't argue against that. Fennekin. We can finally do university in The Sims again? Wait, what? Finally. The Sims Finally. 3 University expansion has been announced. Yes. My dollhouse. Took them how long to do this one when it was the first expansion for two? True facts. Let's see. Sims 3 came out in 2009, so... Ugh. Four years. And we're finally getting to the first expansion from 2. The first and probably best. University was a great expansion to 2. Yeah, I'm not going to lie. I really enjoyed University. Gosh, I really liked Pets, though. A pets is good. I don't know. Were Pets oh. in Vanilla Sims 3? No. No, there, was there a are no Pets pack available. Lame. Part of me really pets. wants to try out Supernatural. Which I because... picked up at midnight while everyone else was picking up Batman the same day, which is the only reason I know that. While Pixie may be all about her very realistic, drama-filled Sims house... I'm all about how weird can we make this? Let's go. Yeah. So, you so like really supernatural, supernatural totally looks appealing but to me. But I see that you can toggle like the supernatural and weird things. Oh, so, so you can have like vampires, yes, magic, no. Yeah. So I'm wondering if I might actually get involved in this because I, having seen that that is an option, I'm like, okay, well maybe I can just try being a little bit weird and like get into this gradually. <laughs> Oh, I I was super disappointed that when I saw that all of The Sims like 3 the... came on the Steam winter sale. First off, to own every release for The Sims 3, it was $160. Uh, this is at steep, steep discounts. I'm yeah, talking 75% to 75%. on the package. $160. It would have been nice. The big problem is you can only use these versions together with each other through Steam. Yeah. And if you have any other content that you've downloaded for the game, apart from things that are on the Steam Workshop and the official EA releases, they won't work. Mm. So, I mean, I'm not as big into downloadable content as the I used to be in The Sims stuff, 2. Like, because it's really limited and awkward in The Sims 3? Yes. And... EA and specifically doesn't EA seem specific, to want to support it. Yeah, because they want to, because they're monetizing it because you they want you to buy their stuff so that you pay for it. Right. Um. So apart from that being kind of crap, uh, I'm, 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 I just haven't felt like going out and trying to like sift through all of the crap and whatever the, you know it takes to. There, there used to be really great websites like Mod The Sims Two and stuff that collected all these things for you. Right. But. So I haven't felt like hunting all that down. It's just the fact that, like, I've acquired most most of my Sims 3 copies, and this is going to make me sound really dumb, but I bought most of these in a retail store on a disc. Most of them. There was one that I got off of Amazon as a download. That is it. <laughs> so I hear you I, tell. 
that it only does disk checks based on the expansion you installed most recently. No, it is so, based on, no, it is chronologically the most recent release that you have installed. Okay. But there was a period where you didn't have to do disk checks, and because, then that changed. Yes, because I had generations, and then when the new expansion came out after that, well, I had to go back to using a disk. Hmm. The moral of the story is that discs suck and are a hassle. But I can usually get them cheaper, so... Right. For some weird reason. Yeah, like, we, we can check this. Hold on. I, I have a plan for this. Oh, because, like, I can go into a brick-and-mortar store that's having a sale on other stuff or has coupons or what have you. You get to hang out with all the cool kids who are getting Batman at midnight. You were like, why are you here? And some people showed up in costume. That was really cool. All right. If you were to pick up The Sims Supernatural from Amazon, it is $32.19. On a disc. On a disc. If you were to download it directly from Amazon, it is $39.99. See? I think someone derped. But it's like that all the time. I think we had some hard derping here. Go get it on a disc and then pull $7 out of your wallet and set them on fire. That makes no sense why the version where they are not physically mailing you anything is cheaper. Yeah, why? why? Oh, economics. You are such a crazy scientist. Is this just them trying to clear quote, out science, their quote. copies of it? No, it, uh, this is deliberate. Uh, the fact is that the marginal cost of printing a disc is like 2 to $3 for them. And they just make this decision because maybe they think that it will discourage piracy. I'm not sure. Or, uh, I, I don't know, maybe it. they don't feel like bandwidth for downloads. I don't know. So yeah. I can't pretend to understand. Next week, what are we talking about? Looper, obviously. Looper, because you need to watch that. Okay. It, although I'm gonna I'm gonna drop this bomb right now. It's surprisingly dark. I've heard. I've heard. Also next week I will be talking about the double fine game, Middle Manager of Justice. Okay. That's a thing. It's free. It's on your iDevices. You should be trying it. Okay. Maybe I'll do that. Um what else do we have in the next week? Uh, I will likely be able to discuss Dishonored by then. Oh, cool. Because I, I recently acquired a copy I of that. I started playing Assassin's Creed 2, but I don't really feel like talking about it, because most of the observation that I have is, I could be playing Batman. <laughs> well, she hasn't gotten to the point where she can kill dudes yet, so I would say that much of the appeal is missing so far. To be yeah. fair, at least the birth scene wasn't a quick time event. It kind of totally was. Man, I blocked that out of my memory. Yeah, it was push this button to wiggle your legs. Push this button to move your arms. Well. Push this button to cry a bit. Tyro cut that out. <laughs> <laughs> no, your embarrassment remains. Hey, I, call, I called the doctor Doctor Who last episode, and that stayed, so you're not yeah. getting off on this one. You, yeah. And now you brought it back up again in case anybody was nice and forgot. <laughs> Well, I mean, I don't feel morally culpable for that fail, because it's not like anybody else corrected me. I corrected myself immediately. Still just... I was oh. gonna let it go, I'm gonna be honest. Some things are not worth starting a fight on the podcast about. But we're going to move on, because I I demand dinner. Yeah, my stomach's gurgling, and it might even be picking up on the mic. <laughs> so, yes... Uh, so, I guess, uh, we'll catch you next week with a review of Looper and some other stuff. More stuff. Uh, next week on Nerd Talk. In the meantime, I'm Pixie. I'm Sen. And I'm Parasim. And thank you for listening to Nerd Talk. It's good to be back. <laughs>